All right, hello. Can you all hear us okay? Cool, welcome, welcome. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick introduction of who we are as a team, and then we'll have our solo introduction as well. Corbin and I have been friends for a while. Uh, we've been hacking on bug bounties for a very long time, and we have found some really cool stories that I think it's valuable and also very entertaining, I think, that we wanted to share on a big stage. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll do it quickly about me. I'm Nahamsek. Uh, my name is Ben Sadegipur, but most people online know me as Nahamsek. I'm a bug bounty hunter, content creator, and I've been bug bounty hunting since 2015. I'm the former head of, head of hacker education at HackerOne, and I'm the co-founder of Hacking Hub. And the good news is with the Hacking Hub, everything that we're gonna talk about today, you can also try on your own. Just gotta go on their website uh, and give it a try if you like some of this stuff as well. And yeah, I'm a public speaker and a trainer. I'm actually doing a training for DEF CON next week, so if you wanna come and learn how I find these crazy things, please join me next week as well. And I've hacked into a bunch of companies, including Apple, Amazon, Zoom, Airbnb, Snapchat, and more. And I think I have like more than a hundred, uh, more than a thousand submissions on a hundred or more companies so far. And I'm going to let Corbin quickly introduce himself, and hopefully we'll take you guys on a good ride of uh, hacks that we have done in the last year. Well, hey, I'm Corbin. Um, sorry, I'm like four foot two, so if you can't see me over this laptop. My bad. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Corbin. I go by CDL on HackerOne. Uh, I've been doing bug bounties since like 2016. Um, I like hacking stuff. Um, also, long story, but I'm a co-founder of a mattress company. Um, so I guess they let anyone in here. So if you want to apply for a talk next year, just put something really random in there and they might say yes. Um, no, I'm not money laundering. If you need a mattress someday, um, you can go over there or you can tackle my co-founder sitting over there. Um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy this talk. Thanks for coming. Oh, just kidding, I'm back. Um, so this is a story about hacking an auto manufacturer. So this is, uh, they had a bug bounty program. Um, so it started with me uh, scanning their IP range, and by their IP range, I mean the entire internet for SSL certificates. Um, and I found a um, host, uh, an IP that had an SSL certificate for um, just their main domain. And when you would hit it on uh, HTTPS, it would just respond with backend IP not found. And their SSL certificate um, was just wildcard.apps.redacted.example.com. Um, and so um, my main idea is, OK, this is an ingress endpoint. If you look at like LinkedIn job posting, et cetera, you can kind of see what sort of services are, they're using. And this, my, my assumption is they're using uh, a lot of microservices. Um, and so a good tip for finding good word lists is to um, do subdomain enumeration. Um, also look at like, I guess that includes like cert sh. Um, another good idea is um, uh, nowadays, like everyone's using microservices. So if you look up Helm charts, um, that's like what a lot of people use for like Kubernetes for deploying services. Um, you can scrape like 13,000 um, different like Helm charts that uh, have like DNS names in them and you can use that to brute force stuff too. Um, so after some brute forcing, I found a host called configuratorprod.apps.redacted.com or .example.com. And um, so from there, uh, and by, like, I knew that this host was hit because I got a different response. It didn't say backend IP not found. The response was different and um, said, like, um, like, path not found or something. It was pretty obvious. So basically, I did, like, FF um, with that host header then. And it turns out a Spring Boot actuator, and it was misconfigured. So the, uh, if you don't know what Spring Boot actuator is, um, when it's misconfigured, there's a couple of different uh, endpoints. And so there's, like, env. Uh, which dumps a bunch of environment variables. Um, and then there's heap dump, which is just like the memory dump of the application. Um, and so within this, I looked through the environment variables in this env endpoint. Um, and there were some interesting things, but the most, um, nothing that was like really like the jackpot that I was excited for. Um, and in this, though, there was um, this field called uh, conf or like spring.cloud config URI. Um, and it had like an OAuth2 endpoint and it uh, contained the credentials, but the client secret was um, redacted because Spring Boot like redacts like secrets or it's supposed to. Um, so you can just use like the heap dump, run strings on it, and then actually grab, you know, that secret. And so um, what if we use just those, like what can we reach with those OAuth2 credentials? Um, so I grabbed those um, and you can actually vhost, um, you can actually hit this like OAuth2 server externally still. So I hit that and authenticated and got a um, auth bearer back. 
And then actually, um, you see the Spring Cloud um, config server. You can also vhost to that. Um, and so I vhosted to that and used the auth to authenticate to the other internal service. And it turns out it was also Spring Boot Actuator and also misconfigured again. And both endpoints were also you know, like open. And this time, in this environment, um, there was a field called source URI. Uh, and it was pointing to their uh, GitHub instance that was hosted. It was like GitHub Enterprise. Um, and there was a, the source username and a source password. And that was also redacted. And it was also a private key um, for the GitHub user. Um, so I hit heap dump again and just ran strings and uh, just grabbed the password. And, <laughs> and so then we could, I, I hit their API and uh, just like GitHub example, API v3 user um, with that username and password. And uh, it turns out it was a super overprivileged account. And I had access to every single GitHub organization and every single repository um, <laughs> for this uh, auto manufacturer. So it's like all the source code for everything ever. Um, and yeah, that was a fun time. <laughs> and they paid me like $5,000 for that bug. <laughs> Which is like, yeah, dumb. Anyways, and this is another uh, fun story. This is how I uh, found a bug a couple years ago to uh, publish fake news. Um, so I'd been doing an unholy amount of uh, virtual uh, host fuzzing again um, against this big media company um, that shall not be named. Um, we're talking like this is there's have like thousands of subdomains, um, like massive word lists, um, and this was like leading up to a Hacker One like live hacking event. Um, and so the day of the event, like we'd found some, I, I was hacking with another hacker named like, Nafi, um, and we had found a couple of cool bugs. Um, and during the day of the event, I found this weird host. Um, called like, uh, this is like completely redacted. It's like xyzproxy.prod.k8s, whatever you can read. Um, and it responded with a different 404 page than like everything else had. And so I started directory brute forcing and uh, I had like no idea what it was doing, but there was a couple endpoints like slash create and slash update. And so if you hit like dash create, it just responded with like 405 method not allowed. So obviously you just tried doing like a post or a put request instead. So I just tried posting like x equals x, um, and uh, it gave me an error um, and said, oh, "That's just not 405 method not allowed. It should say 415 content type." So it gave me an error saying like the content type um, was wrong, and so I tried JSON instead and just did like CDL um, CDL, and it dumped every um, like known property that should be posted in that JSON body. <laughs> so like I made it really easy. Okay, thanks. Um, and so I spent the next like three hours of the event trying to figure out um, what this JSON body was really supposed to be. So I just like sent all the fields it was supposed to be, um, just like random characters in them. And I just got like a bunch of more errors. But it was really helpful because it said like, it gave me exactly like what the error like was. And so like uh, gave me an error about not being able to read tags into an array. So it's like, okay, well tags shouldn't be a string. It should be an array instead. So I just like changed that. Um, um, another error was like in the streams tag, um, it was like AA, or I just put like A in there and it said like, oh, need, you need at least two bytes to base 64, um, like decode or encode or whatever. And so I was like, okay, let me just put like some random base, I'll just change that to base 64. And okay, um, it worked. Uh, but what did it do? Like I had no idea what this API was doing. And so it was actually really funny. The, the event ended and I'm like, dang, I thought there was going to be a cool bug here. And so like I had some drinks. Um, I left uh, Vegas. Actually, no, I didn't quite leave Vegas. I was sitting in the airport the next morning, and I went back to this. I'm like, okay, well, what is this update endpoint actually doing? And I was really curious about the UID field. So I just went to like their main news site and just view source an article and saw like UUID in like the like meta description. I was like, well, what if I tried to specify that in the update endpoint? Like, there's no way that would actually work, right? Um, so yeah, we post it. Um, we change the news article to my name and say this is a demo release. And by the way, this was like a ver was like a testing news article I found. It wasn't like the front page. <laughs> Not a good idea. And it actually worked. So I could just like change the news whatever I want. And it was like during an election too, so I thought it'd be like really funny to just put some shit on there. <laughs> and, th and then the best part, and so like I wrote this like really fast. I got in the plane and I'm like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> And then they thought I was working with an insider and I had to spend like three days writing exactly how I found this issue and how I uh, figured out everything. So I had to write like a 10 page paper. It was like I was 
Oh, actually, I was still in college, so it was just like an extra essay assignment. Um, but they ended up paying um, for that bug as well. <laughs> Gotta love a good verbose uh, API. All right, the next one I'm gonna talk about is uh, a prison break. This is actually a prison system that uh, is used in a number of different states and a uh, number of different areas that we cannot name also. So, uh, this application was originally created for inmates to be able to talk to their friends. They can talk to visitors. They can talk to uh, make a request from the people that work at the uh, prison. And also hold things like their social security number, any other records, the conversations they've had. They can send photos. Uh, everything, their medical records, you name it, it's on this website. And some of it is public record because if you're a felon, apparently you don't have any privacy and everything's online. But the cool thing is uh, there are some private data that's not supposed to leak. So there's a couple of different assets that are connected to each other uh, that we need to understand. The first one is the app uh, prison system.fake. We're just going to call it that for security purposes and reasons. Uh, they gave me access to this. It was limited functionality. There were some JavaScript files that indicated there is some functionality that does exist, but for some reason we couldn't access any of them. And there's also like shortcut keys for these. So you could do like a Shift Z, it will take you to this page. Shift F to this page, and you know so on. You get it. So there's also a, a limited session for now, at least, that we have access to. So it's very limited of what we can do on this page and. Anything that I'd like to access that's leaked into the JavaScript file gets me just redirected to the main site that I'm on. So we don't have access to it. I don't know if this was supposed to be on pur purpose or someone broke the site. I have no clue. I just know that I couldn't access anything and I was just staring at a blank page for this application. So this is kind of what the shortcut looks like. So I hit Control U, for example. It takes me to the admin site I, with the users. I hit Control A, it's the activity on the users, uh, Control S, and then there's a Control D and N, which is a doc site, right? So this is a different site. Somehow the session was supposed to carry over, but obviously I probably didn't have the right permissions and I wasn't able to access it. And every time you go to these sites right here, it will take me back to the main site from the last site called app.whatever.com. Well, the JavaScript leaked this thing that said, if you hit this site, it will authenticate you to the doc site. So all you have to do is directly go to this API call and it would redirect you to the docs website and then it would give you an authentication token. So we actually have access to the doc site. We're supposed to be able to read the documentation for some reason and it gives you an authentication token in your request. So it's printed out, it's not hidden anywhere. And I was like, oh, okay, like, is, how am I able to authenticate to this doc site, but originally I didn't have access to it, so the user token makes sense. So what do you do? You just grab that user token and you start throwing it at things and see if it sticks. So naturally I try to do admin, give it the auth token, nothing works. I try doing a slash admin, maybe I have to have the right path, doesn't work. But turns out if you have the right path and the right functionality, and then you give it this auth token, it suddenly opens it up. So I can see these settings. But still, what can I do with this information? I want more. I want to know what I have access to. Well, it turns out that I have access to a lot. Any API call that I had seen in the JavaScript file I had access to, including this thing called reset password. And this is a short version of it. It's fake. But more of the story was it took a user ID and a password, and it would give you the new password that you set up. So I can say user ID equals one. Password is password one. Cool, we can do that. But the, pass the problem was it comes back and it says success. I don't have two things here. I don't have a username or an email address. I cannot log in and I couldn't do anything with it. So I go to Twitter, I'm, I like crowdsourcing things. I worked at a crowdsourcing bug bounty platform for a while. So I just posted this tweet. I was like, hey, uh, I can reset passwords. Uh, I just don't have any information. How do I log in? And I got a bunch of answers, none of them worked. Well, it turns out the answer was in the JavaScript file for me. There is another endpoint. <laughs> you can impersonate anybody on the website because you're an admin, and all it takes is a user ID, right? So all I have to do now is I say, okay, I have a password, I have the user ID, I want admin, I want user ID one, the password is password, and I ask for it. So the chain one, the first chain that I got from this vulnerability was I log in, I change the password for admin or whatever user I want, 
and I impersonate that user, I have a read-only account, I can't change anything, but you have a settings page that leaks both the username and the email for that account, and then you can just go back and re-log in and get into that website. <laughs> so they give you everything you need. It's, uh, it's a very weird one. But uh, I'm a CVSS fan, and this kind of looked lame because you see how it says like privilege is still high? That means you have to have an account to log in and be able to do this. So the, the, this prison system gave us an account. The foothold that we got in was given to us by them, and that's not enough. Like You want to find a way to do all of this and turn that high on the third one on the left. Oops, too fast, there we go. You want to turn that third one that says high into a low because the score goes from a nine to a 10 and we're almost there. We're like 0.9 away from it. Well, there is something really funny. Since I, have, I can see everything, I can see what the admins see, I can see what the functionalities are, I can test for things that I could also go out and test out from a remote side. So I'm testing out everything that an admin could see when somebody registers as a visitor. So you can't do an XSS in the name, you can't do an XSS in the address, you can't do XSS in the account details, but you can put special characters in the email field because I don't think anyone's gonna put special characters because Gmail doesn't allow that, but I don't have to have a real email address to be able to inject a payload into this page. So you put a cross-site scripting email address, so you make your email address become something like Ben plus the XSS payload, which is a script tag, pointing to my website at gmail.com. You sign up, and whenever the admins go to look at the list of users on slash users, you don't have to go to my username, by the way. The email shows in slash users. So whenever slash user is uh, opened up, the XSS is fired. So this chain that we have, the second chain is we bind XSS to user, we, uh, we log in or force them to change a password, impersonate, grab the username and email for our target. We log in and we take over their prison and we just let everybody out and put money on their books. And that becomes from a 9.1 to a 10.0 based on just looking at the chain. So more of the story is there's always a way out even if you're stuck in a prison and technically we found it for this one. I'm gonna have uh, Corbin do the next one. <laughs> All right, so this one's about hacking a crypto exchange. Um, I'd been hacking on some uh, crypto programs for a little bit. I saw this tweet um, called, uh, uh, from Hacking Proof. Uh, it said like, oh, it's the biggest bug bounty reward among crypto exchanges. You know, you can get anywhere from 50,000 to a million dollars um, for a critical bug. And I'm like, sick, let's do it. <laughs> and so, um, I signed up to this uh, crypto exchange called KuCoin and just started proxying my browser uh, traffic through Burp Suite. And I just clicked every single button and every single thing I could possibly click. Um, and then I just started going through my Burp history. And I came across this Git request. Um, it's just like git forward slash API Zendesk. And like, I'm not going to read actually all that. That's way too much to read. Um, <laughs> but you can kind of see how that looks. And um, it responded with just some adjacent blob. Um, about like their help center, and in that was like a URL to like kucoin.zendesk.com. I thought that was a little weird, um, and also notice how it says just like API v2 instead of the um, API Zendesk. Um, so I was like, is this endpoint just proxying to the Zendesk API? Like, what if we just hit other paths um, besides that help center endpoint? So I just hit the API v2, and it just responded with just like a big HTML 404 page. So I'm like, okay, this is kind of curious and interesting. Um, so I Googled the Zendesk API documentation and found the following text. So you must be an author, you must be a verified user to make API requests. You can authorize against the API using either basic authentication with your email address and password, with your email address or an API token or with an OAuth access token. So now I'm thinking, if you have to be a verified user to make API requests, can we just use this API as KuCoin's authenticated user? And so I found in their documentation there's an endpoint just like API v2 tickets.json, and it just loads all the support tickets. So I tried it, and it actually <laughs> worked. <laughs> and so, yeah, you could see there was like request for like some sort of uh, criminal investigation. That was like one of the earliest tickets. Um, and even more fun, there's a search.json endpoint, which allows you to search tickets, obviously. <laughs> so 
what if we tried searching for like session tokens or something? Um, so I looked up the query language, language um, and you could specify like the created date. Um, you could search tickets by the created date. And then I also searched for just the word session. Um, and it turns out uh, if you use the mobile app, it actually leaks their session token. <laughs> and I don't know why that happens, but it does. Um, you can also just search for like um, KYC info, um, like licenses, passports, um, because it also just like discloses like the attachments when you look at each ticket. Um, and then you can also just dump all of the users with the users.json endpoint. Um, so that discloses like the person's name, uh, email, their phone number, uh, their location. Um, and this API is even better because it's like you can paginate, so I can just like hit every single page and just pull every user ever. <laughs> and so I reported it to them, and they're like, oh, uh, yeah, okay, this is like a high, this isn't a crit, okay, that's fair. Um, and then they just gave me $5,000 and said, go away. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's the end of that story. I'll hand it back to Ben. <laughs> All right, this is uh, where the fun begins. We actually, so everything we talked about is different, uh, in a different industry. So it was the car manufacturer, there was the prison, there was the news media, and then there was the cryptocurrency stuff. But now we're gonna do a back-to-back -back casino because it's, we're in Vegas and we're at a bunch of casinos and for once we were able to beat the casinos at their own game. So this one, yeah, we got some money from the casinos. All right, so I, uh, this is one of the bigger European one. We have a US version of it. He's gonna do the US version. I'll do it with, for the European folks. Uh, this one has uh, a lottery site. People could sign up and they could do things with their lottery um, site. And I don't know what the purpose of it was. Being in California, apparently you can't have access to this site, but I could at least see some of the functionality. Uh, so you have this login page that comes back to you and the login page says, hey, um, this is how my login works. You send a request, you say username and password and hits auth login and there is an also a forgot password link right under that login page that also has a forgot password. Very normal stuff, there is no registration, at least that we can see. Uh, there is nothing else. It, it, this is an admin panel. It's not just a lottery system, it's a back end of the lottery system. I'm assuming some sort of a online thing. So the thing to highlight here, I wish I could point to it, but uh, this right here, it shows a auth login within API v1. So the problem becomes what else can we find on this page because the JavaScript page, the, the page didn't have any JavaScript really that was interesting and there was nothing that I could find that was, you know, use, uh, useful or usable to get access to this site. Well, you start to do a brute force for API v1, I, I did API v1 auth login, I did, you know, we have that one, we have forgot password. There is one that hits for a 405, that's new, so it's just slash new. And then there was users, which is 401, because I don't have access to see the users. Obviously, if you give it a user ID of 123, 401, user me, 401, and then there's also a verify for users. But the interesting one out of them all is the new, auth slash new, which piqued my interest. Well, it turns out uh, auth.new is also very verbose, just like he was mentioning. It told me like, hey, you're missing an email, password, and a password verification. So all you have to do was hit that API, and you can create an account. You can, so you can create an account, you can log in, but the trick was this is an internal panel, so somebody had to actually confirm this account for me, or there's, there's a way to confirm it. We're not sure how. Uh, I didn't get an email, so even though I give it an email address, I didn't get anything that says, hey, come and confirm your account because this is supposed to be internal. So I'm assuming if I didn't have an at domain or whatever that domain was, I wouldn't get in, uh, any emails from him. But when you log in, we, oh, sorry, before we log in, we do know two things. There is a verify and there's a user slash me that I have access to. Those two that I'm showing on the screen are from the previous scan that I did, but I remember to have access to those two things. So if I'm authenticated to my non-confirmed account, and I hit the slash me, it's gonna give me my user account's details, but it is gonna also give me a verification code. So it says, here's your user, and here's your verification uh, code, by the way, which didn't make sense a lot at the time, but then I realized that I have verify that I can use to activate my account. So I have also slash verify that I have to go through. So the way the verification thing worked was, you give it a user ID, you give it your verification ID, 
it verifies that it actually it's a success, but somehow I still couldn't log in and I couldn't do much with it. But there's one thing I want to keep in mind. A lot of times in the casino or in the in like a corporate environment or wherever you work for, usually they create email addresses like this. And there's one more thing to say. The login page asks for a username and not a user, uh, an email address. So I don't know what my username is. But the company usually gives you your, use, your first name, dot last name at domain.com. It's pretty standard. A lot of companies do that. Unless you're at a small startup, then you get your first name and it's way cooler, but not the case here. So when you send this verification email, it takes the email address, not the username. It says, what's your email address? What's your verification ID? You send it back and it says success. So when we go back to the user ID like I mentioned, it's asking me for a username. I have my email. Verification took my email address with my verification code, but I still don't have a username. Nothing was emailed to me. Well, I thought, let's go back to this. Let's try, the, let's drop the email address that we give it. Maybe by default, whatever is the, the string before the at sign is probably the username. So we're going to go ahead and try that really quickly. So. As I mentioned all this, we're going to take that and we're going to log in and it actually logged in. So I give it my username becomes whatever is before the add string is automatically your username. The password is what I gave it. My account's activated. And when I get into this account where it's verified, it gives me access to all the endpoints that I had found. So I can see other users. Um, Oops, I can see all the other users, the forgot password I don't care about, auth new we don't care about. Uh, then there's the users, you can do like one, two, three. There's users slash me and user slash verify. But it turns out the users one is the best one uh, because it gives you a list of all the users and all their details and it's only in read only. So my account isn't an admin fully, it's just a read only, probably some like, I don't know, operations person and just needs to have access to read the account data. Uh, and I don't have a lot of functionality access, but what I do have is a list of all the usernames and their uh, email addresses. So what we do is we uh, I just grab a, the list of users. So whatever the usernames are, I'll grab them because I need that for the login. I took a good password list, and when I say a password list, I mostly mean uh, password one, password one, two, three, and password two, and, the pass and then the company's name and the year. And it turned out I can actually <laughs> get an access to one of those accounts with password one. So one of the actual admin accounts that I dumped the username from, from the read-only account, had a password of password one. And it actually gave me access to it, which turned out to give me access to this entire uh, casino's backend for the lottery system. And you had a file upload, you had other users. There was lottery details, but being a bug bounty hunter, you don't really get to uh, have a lot of fun and see what kind of uh, shenanigans you can get into. But more of the story is uh, there's also passwords at work. I don't know, it's 2023, somehow password one and password one, two, three still work. So if you have a good list of usernames when you hack into a company and you just can dump it through an API, it never hurts to try these easy passwords. Uh, so yeah, this is the original thing that I had. It's just a bunch of non-access things to finally getting the keys to the kingdom uh, from one of the biggest European casinos that are out there. And uh, now we have another one that's a large US one that I'll let this guy handle. <laughs> So this is a story about fishing, uh, not a casino. Um, so a little backstory on this one. Uh, this was for like a live bug bounty event. And so they invited a bunch of like bug bounty hunters and they thought it'd be a good idea to put social engineering in scope. The only rule they had was um, don't email more than 100 to 200 people. That was the only rule. And they said they'd pay like $1,000 per user fished. So I was like, okay, well what if I get 200 people to, you know, fall for a phishing email. Um, this is also like a really bad idea to invite a 23-year-old 23, 23 with like no good filter on what I should and shouldn't do. Um, yeah. So a little recon uh, on this company is they used uh, Okta in Duo 2FA and it was not a casino to Okta.com. Um, and when these uh, users would log in, they would enter their username and password, um, and then they'd be prompted to enter like a, a six digit number um, from Duo to log in. So I just bought a domain that looks similar to theirs. Um, I set up Evil uh, Nginx2, um, GoFish, and Mail, Mailgun. I'm not going to get into the, all the infrastructure. But basically, with like Evil Nginx, uh, it, it basically is just uh, like allows you to basically 
uh, reverse proxy to the real Okta instance, um, but also just like man in the middle and capture everything between the two. Um, so that was kind of a pain to set up, but I've Googled enough, read documentation, um, set up all the infrastructure for it. And the next challenge was to figure out, okay, well, who should I actually like try to fish here? Um, so uh, God bless uh, LinkedIn Sales Navigator. <laughs> uh, I just uh, signed up for like $100 for like a, a, a subscription for a month. And, and I uh, was able to figure out their email format was like um, the first character of their first name, um, last name at uh, the company.com. So I wrote like a really, really simple Chrome extension um, that would let me just literally just like scroll through LinkedIn uh, uh, Sales Navigator and just grab their first name, last name, and then just generate this. Um, and so, okay, I have emails, but like, what should I say in this phishing email? Or in hindsight now, it's like, this is never do this. Um, I'm a complete douchebag. <laughs> um, and so like, I've actually never done a phishing campaign against a real company in like an environment. And this is exactly why you probably shouldn't, uh, invite a uh, 23 year old bug bounty hunter to do this. Um, but I just was thinking like, okay, what would I fall for? And what would I click on? Um, and so again, it was really rough, and I'm a complete douchebag for doing this. And so, <laughs> so I typed a few different variations. I'm like, okay, we're gonna have like a reference number in like brackets, um, and like just keep it like short and say like action required because like okay, you have to fill this out. And so I mean, you guys can read <laughs> the questionnaire um, actually. Uh, pointed to a subdomain of theirs. So if you like hover the link, it would be like uh, casino.com, and I abused uh, a cross-site scripting bug to actually redirect to my phishing page. So it looked, I guess, even a little more. Um, so yeah, I sent this to like 200 employees, and within like not even a minute, the cookies just started rolling in. <laughs> <laughs> and so then now I can just authenticate to Okta, and within two minutes, uh, I had access to their root AWS uh, account. <laughs> so that includes like all their EC2 instances, uh, all their databases, literally everything you could possibly dream of. Um, so here's a picture of me just sending the email. Here's 30 seconds after. <laughs> <laughs> so the result is I sent it to 200 people and I ended up with uh, 40 pairs of credentials. I had access to Outlook, um, Word calendar. Um, I fished uh, like one of the vice presidents actually. Um, <laughs> uh, I had access to AWS console, the GitHub, uh, their like customer search tool, um, a buttload of internal applications. Um, and then they never did this again because apparently like the Nevada like gaming commission uh, like requires these casinos to report each instance and fines them. <laughs> <laughs> And so I think I cost them like several million dollars in like legal, <laughs> legal fines. But hey, I guess they learned their lesson and I learned <laughs> mine. They didn't pay a thousand dollars per uh, user, uh, but they paid me a twenty thousand dollars for that. So it was a fun bug. <laughs> Not bug. Yeah. But yeah, you can. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have, usually you're supposed to end your talk with solutions. Unfortunately, we don't have any solutions for phishing, uh, with verbose APIs. Uh, yeah, he says get good is a good answer, a good solution for it. Uh, yeah, but I mean, if you want to try these out, they're all on the on our website. You can give it a try. Uh, if you want to come and talk to us, we I, actually, we think we do have a little bit of time. We ended a little bit early for questions. If there are any questions, we can answer them. Otherwise, please connect with us. We're both on Twitter. I'm at, Nah uh, at Nahamsek. He's at Hacker. Thank you, and then, uh, yeah, if there's any questions, we'll be happy to take them. I'm glad we were able to answer all you guys' questions. Thank you for attending our talk.